so uh, thank you very much for joining us again and uh, thank you very much also for people subscribing to our YouTube channel and uh, we are uh, here in the old town of Edinburgh again our old stomping ground because Joe and I of course uh, we stay in Edinburgh so we're very familiar with this part we're going to talk about what we call the Cannon Gate in Edinburgh it's quite a complicated uh, thing to describe because uh, people see it as being part of Edinburgh which it is today but it wasn't originally that it was a separate uh, entity if you like in fact it was called a borough borough of regality regality r-e-g-a-l-i-t-y and uh, what it was was the king was the main land holder but the king would few uh, which is an old Scottish word f-e-u which would mean almost uh, let you have the use of land but at the end of the day it all belonged to the king but he feud it out to what was called crown vassals and they were noble men usually and uh, they would feud it from the king and they would feud it to the people who would come and stay so both of these people would be taking money from people living in certain parts of Scotland and that uh, existed in the Cannon Gate in a different way to the way it existed in Edinburgh, which was a royal borough, but this was a borough of regality. So it was kind of delegated down the way the land was divided. And today, the old town of Edinburgh is like a fishbone. It's got Main Street, which is the Royal Mile here, or High Street. And leading off it are these small streets. And if you think of a fish skeleton, the main uh, spine bone of the fish, the High Street, this St Mary's Street would be one of the uh, little bones that come off the main bone as in the fish. Now what I'm going to do is turn this around here and show us... It's a very noisy corner we're on so keep your ears peeled and opened but uh, part of the Royal Mile has been closed so a lot of the traffic has been diverted up here because they're repairing the uh, cobbles on the Royal Mile. Yeah that's right and they're making a really good job of them. I had a look at them and inspected them the other day. Now if you'd like to look at this here, the Waverley... uh, bar here. Now there's been a bar here from at least the 19th century and uh, we're getting some waves from people <laughs> in the car <laughs> and you may notice this blue figure uh, climbing up the wall now that uh, blue figure is by an Israeli artist who trained in Tel Aviv or Tel Aviv and uh, she was Ofra Zimbalista called that and well known for her uh, installations of numerous figures sometimes going up buildings. So uh, the blue figure here is by her. Now she uh, sadly passed away in 2014 but she had an exhibition, very successful one, in Edinburgh in the Art Festival in 2004. And there was much more of these figures all around uh, Edinburgh's old town back then on hotels and old buildings and so on as well. Now, I've had, uh, I'm a member of what is called Lost Edinburgh, and it's a lot of locals on that on Facebook, and I was asking, what do you think this is? And I was getting all sorts of funny um, replies, and they said, oh, this is a guy who's been for a night out, and uh, his wife has locked the door, not letting him in, so he's trying to climb up the wall. I think it's wee Willy Winky. <laughs> wee Willy Winky is another <laughs> idea. And somebody else said, oh, somebody going to put up a satellite dish? Oh, yes, and then some... <laughs> so I've had all sorts of humorous comments as well so you might actually think of one because now I've told you who the artist is of the Zimbalista you might like to put your own take on this on our comments and say what you think that might be okay so I think it's great because I, I love art of course now the Waverley Bar today if you got closer to that you would see that there are sculptural heads which go back to the 1890s just on either side of where it says the Waverley and they portray Bacchus who was the god of wine so very very significant now the Waverley bar is also quite famous because it was a well-known folk venue for folk music going back to the 1960s and people like Billy Connolly and people like the Dubliners maybe you've heard of the Clancy brothers as well and the Corries were well known to have actually played up above here and there is still a space for music today for a folk uh, venue today and myself I've actually played in here 
on occasions down in the bar itself. So it's, um, it, it's a great landmark here in St Mary's Street. St Mary's Street is just one of these streets in what we call the Cannon Gate. And uh, we're going to walk up a bit to, to the junction, but, but before we do that, we maybe want to get a little bit closer if we can cross the street and uh, Joe can get a close-up view of these uh, heads of Bacchus. Because I'll wait until the lights turn green, small. there we yeah, are. It is, yeah. uh, we just got to ask the question, uh, has it been raining, raining in Edinburgh? Just a little. <laughs> yeah, we have had storms here. It's, as they say in the north of England, it's coming down like stair rods. And just about an hour ago, we had another storm. Um, but Princess Street Gardens and Princess Street was flooded. Mike's area got flooded. Really um, badly. So yes, we've had a few storms. So you can see the, you see the the head there. Of Bacchus, yeah. And inside there, things are beginning to open up, and uh, the bar is open. It's a beautiful bar. It is wonderful. The gantry is amazing, and we've got here Scotland's part in the Euros soccer. Yeah competition we actually drew with England yeah which was very satisfying but England are now through to the semi-finals and so the we'll best see. of luck to all of our English viewers for tomorrow the best of luck yeah yeah, yeah. We're, we're behind really, you we're really rooting for you okay yeah. so we're coming up now to the corner of uh, St Mary Street and the Cannon Gate and why is it called the Cannon Gate and mentioned it was a borough of regality and uh, that meant it had a separate uh, government and lawmaking and the what we said was the crown vassal the top nobleman or nobleman could actually uh, control how people interacted you know what they did or what they didn't do put into law certain things that they wanted to happen or didn't want to happen so they even had the right to put somebody in prison into the toll booth so the only thing they actually couldn't quite control directly was if somebody was going to try and do something to the king. And that would be such a serious uh, matter that that was out with control of that uh, crown vassal. So you maybe appreciate some of the architecture. This is a retail street as well. And we've got a wee surprise for you next week because we're going to uh, cover one of the local retail outlets. We're not going to actually tell you too much about it other than it's artisan and it's going to be uh, a traditional garment um, but we won't actually say too I think much. they can join up the oh, dots and those clues. Yes. Like, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, there's a lot of artisans who work and uh, ply the trade here in this part of the, the city and they keep the old trades alive so backpack maker, leather makers cashmere, uh, kilt makers and uh, we are hoping to, well we are going to be speaking to some tomorrow and we're hoping to do a special on the artisan craftsmen and craftswomen who live and work in this part of the old town as well. Absolutely, now we're coming here to this pub and it's called the White Horse and it's the oldest pub uh, well, it, it, there's lots of pubs, I actually say they're the oldest pubs, but um, this has got a lot of stories behind it, so we know it dates back to at least the 18th century. And where, what it was, it was the main start and place and main finish place. Now you may think, what's he talking about? Well, it was when, if you were travelling from London in a coach, this would be the stop where the horses would stop at some point or if you were going to London then you would pick up the horses and coach here. They had 20 coaches here and 100 horses which would be kept behind here and if you read some of the old classic novels like Dickens and Anthony Trollope you'll know that the way people got around these days and they used to have to stay in inns like this uh, if they were waiting overnight to get the coach in the morning or whatever or travelling back at night. And it was also a popular place for many English uh, marriages because the law in England was a bit more difficult. And uh, just, sorry, I'm just letting the passers by pass. Um, but the, the law in Scotland was a bit more liberal and it was easier to get married here. You may know the story of Gretna Green where you could actually just go and get married and the blacksmith would marry you. Well, it was very much the same in Scotland generally. 
so people would come here and stay here, couples that were going to get married. So that was a, a big uh, niche thing here as well. Why is it called the White Horse? Uh, it was really because the owner of the pub and uh, he uh, was a gambling person and uh, he couldn't stop himself gambling and he ended up gambling at the Leith races and he gambled on a white horse and he managed to actually win. So that meant that he was able to hang on to this pub and he had a portrait originally, which is not there today, of the horse which he staked his money on. Now there was another little bar around the corner uh, and it was run by a man called James Boyd in the 18th century. And you may have heard of Dr. Johnston and James Boswell, Dr. Samuel Johnson and James Boswell. Um, they, Johnston, he was a, like an essayist, he was a writer, he wrote the, the dictionary and uh, James Boswell, well he was English and we had uh, James Boswell who was Scottish and uh, he was uh, a writer also and he wanted to meet with Samuel Johnson and they actually met together uh, just around the corner in the pub run by James Boyd and in the writings of James Boswell it's said that Samuel Johnson asked for uh, a sweet lemonade. He had some lemonade and he wasn't very happy with it and he said to the waiter I want a sweeter version. So what the waiter did he went and got a lump of sugar and popped it in uh, Samuel Johnson's drink. And Samuel Johnson wrote in his diary, it was one of the most disgusting things to see the waiter with his greasy fingers popping the sugar in his drink. So he threw, he threw the drink, the lemonade, out the window. So this area was a big meeting place where people coming from England would meet up. And there's an example of Johnson and Boswell. Well, it's fair to say that Samuel Johnson had nothing very much nice to say when he arrived here in Edinburgh, but after the tours around the Highlands of Scotland, after the tours around the Highlands of Scotland, he became a complete convert yeah. to the whole of the Scottish thing. So I think, uh, give Boswell his due, he worked hard as a tourist guide with one of the hardest clients <laughs> in history. Yeah, and this was the start of the famous journey to the Hebrides. And uh, you might be able to track that down if you're interested in reading about the banter between the two of them and how uh, Johnson perceives Scotland. But and I will say also the White Horse Inn is a really nice place if you want seafood, fresh seafood, then the White Horse is a great for seafood. Yeah, just a few years ago it's repositioned itself so yeah. it's not simply a bar, a public house, it's a place where you can go in and you can get oysters and all sorts and it's bringing back the traditional places back in the 18th century where people would go and eat oysters and drink wine and so on. So it's quite good to see it uh, regaining that status in a way and as well. And it's the same with a lot yeah. of the bars and restaurants down here, Mike, that they've all um, regenerated themselves and the food down in this part of the town is really nice, if you can get in, um, yeah. because that's part of the problem now is that because it's right in the middle of the tourist land, it's difficult for the citizens to get in here. <laughs> that's, that's right, that's right. So what we're going to do is we're going to let these people pass for a minute and we're going to uh, talk about uh, some of these closes or accesses that come off the Royal Mile. Now this one here, uh, just beside the, the, sorry, the White Horse, uh, this would be quite commonly used and uh, the stabling of the horses and where the, the carriage is would have just been behind there. Uh, as most inns would have that. I'm going to walk down a little more, a bit more. Now we've got a regeneration programme going on at the moment, uh, urban redevelopment, because some of these courses are quite forbidding and they're quite dirty and uh, people avoid them sometimes because they think they're not safe. And uh, to improve their access, to improve the environment for the residents also, there is a programme happening around this time and it's called the 12 Closes Partnership. We'll just have a look at this one, I think your signal might drop if we go in there, Mike. That's yeah, yeah, thing. you can maybe just get it from a distance. Yeah. Now, the 12 Closes Partnership is uh, three uh, organisations, and one of these is Napier University, and the other one is Edinburgh World Heritage, and the other one is Edinburgh Council and the three of them are funding and they're actually conversing with the local residents and getting their opinions. Um, so to improve 
access to do away with some of the unsavoury things that might go on in some of these more hidden corners, not the best hidden corners of Edinburgh. They're wanting to make them uh, comfortable to walk through and also a bit spectacular. And if you look up the top there, you will see the metal work. So if you stand out here, Mike, I'll go in and then you can take the signal. Yeah, yeah. And see if okay. the signal works. So you might, uh, Joe's just letting you have a wee look at these there, these grills. And this is called Piri's Close. Now, if we're going to go back to the 18th century, and again, that this originates from that time, this would have been an access to the residence of Alexander Piri. Now, Alexander Piri uh, had lots of different uh, interests, and one of them was setting up a brewery for the making of beer, uh, just close to his house in this area that we're in at the moment. But he was also involved in pin manufacturing. Now today we take it for granted, but maybe don't use pins quite so much, or aware of them. But you know, just like ordinary pins, talk about pinheads, they had a, a factory down in Leith where they made these pins, and they also made stays. Now the ladies might be a bit more familiar with what stays are, but they were for Don't be sexist, corsets Mike. Don't be sexist. And stuff. Men, men wore cor cor corsets as well. Yes. <laughs> Carry on. On you go. Yeah. Uh, so they were involved in lots of different things, but an event happened here in 1867 where at the back there was a firework factory and uh, a chap was actually packaging, wrapping fireworks and he was uh, called Thomas Hammond and all of a sudden uh, the paper caught fire and the fireworks workshop started to go on fire and you can just imagine all the smoke building up into these high buildings and some of these uh, top flats were about 60 feet from the ground and it was absolutely terrifying and then there was gunpowder in his workshop also and a spark went and hit the gunpowder and there was a massive explosion which threw the windows and the ironwork away from here right across and, and hit a shop on the other side of the, the street but the worst thing is of people trapped in this building and mainly women and children. And fortunately, uh, several of the women were able to escape because there was a chimney sweep passing, fortunately, with these ladders, and he was able to go up there and rescue. And uh, there was also other people. It took a long time before the fireman was able to come. It took about 20 minutes, so you had to act quickly. And there was a passerby, and this man was called James Michael Ballantyne. And he's one of the unsung heroes of Scottish literature. He was a children's book writer, well known for his publication Coral Island, and he was a general good old guy. And he was also the nephew of Ballantyne the publisher, who was uh, publishing Walter Scott's books. And they stayed down here in the Cannon Gate because the Cannon Gate was a very significant place for the publishing of books. And he was passing and he was aware uh, that people were in a terrible situation. One woman jumped out the window and she fell and she, just before she died she said, my wee bairn is up there, please somebody help and she died and um, James, he went into the building and he went up to the top flat, he was trying to cover his face with his sleeve and all the dark smoke and he was able to find the child but unfortunately the child did not survive. He did not give up, he was coughing, he was going to pass out, but he came back down the stairs again and he went back in there at least four times. Now this is uh, J.M. Ballantyne. Now he was quite an adventurous guy because he wrote books and he was in uh, Canada and he was involved with the fur trade in Canada as a young guy and he was very adventurous and very uh, he, he wouldn't let something like this just go. He would want to involve himself. So he was highly involved in the rescue. So that was a major traumatic event. And of course, heightened by the close living here in the Cannon Gate, where people were on top of each other, multiple families living in very small spaces, a lot of wood in the construction as well. So Piri's Close, okay, uh, just where we've been looking was the site of that dreadful event. And Joe can maybe just take a scan up there to see how high up that is. And speaking of fireworks, happy belated 4th of July to our friends in the United States. 
and happy 1st of July to our friends in Canada for your celebrations. And I do believe there was a big firework explosion in Maryland. Oh. <laughs> the whole firework display went up at once. Amazing. You want to, you see the flags, we've got the heraldic flags out just now, which is another uh, thing that uh, really brings back the history and spectacular view of this ancient part of the Cannon Gate. Well, the Queen was here last week right. as well. So the Queen was up and doing a Holyrood week. Uh, she was up, um, she went to the Iron Brew factory. If you haven't yes. heard of Iron Brew, if you haven't tasted Iron Brew, try it. It's lovely. It's our second national drink. And she went to open up a, a new Iron Brew factory. Yeah, I've, I've, I've had guests over, Joe, and I'm sure you've had the same. And somebody said to me once, describe the taste of what Iron Brew is like. And somebody said, chewing gum. Yeah. It's like chewing gum. And it's bright orange as well. And my son absolutely loves it. But uh, there's a lot of sugar in there. So you've got to watch. And we've got a sugar tax as well in, this, in Scotland too. And they also had said it's one of the best hangover cures as well. Yeah. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at something else here before Joe takes over. And another good restaurant on, the, on, the, on this part of the Royal Mile is the Wedgwood restaurant just across the street. Again, I would highly recommend that I've taken various groups in there and the food is fantastic. That's the Wedgwood. Well, well, you know, Joe, I'm in the Sir Walter Scott Club and maybe you want to join that because they had an online dining experience with the Wedgwood restaurant and they were providing food uh -huh. that would have been presented to Sir Walter Scott. And of course, this is the 250th anniversary of the birth of Sir Walter Scott. So, uh, the Edinburgh Sir Walter Scott Club. Right, so we'll have a wee look. I don't know how easily so we're going to see this. this building here is the Cranston House, Mike. This was opened as a... This used to be the Christian Institute. And then it became the Edinburgh School of Languages. Um, it was built as a mission, um, similar to ones in the grass market. Yeah, okay. So what we're going to do here is point up to this little man up here on the architecture. Now many Edinburgh people wonder, what is this about? And the speculation, but this is called Morocco's land. Now, and it is thought, whoops, there's my umbrella going up. It's thought that this figure is the Emperor of Morocco. Now, why on earth was a connection with that here in Edinburgh? Well, going back to the 17th century, uh, there was one Andrew Gray. Now, Andrew Gray was a bit of an activist and he got himself put in the Tollbooth prison in Edinburgh and he was accused of uh, getting people to riot. So he wasn't, uh, he, he was a very kind of loud person. Uh, very active person and he uh, escaped from the Tolbooth prison did Andrew Gray in the 17th century and he made his way to Leith and he was actually captured he was enslaved and uh, by pirates and these pirates took him off to Morocco where he became a slave to the Emperor of Morocco now he did quite well for himself in Morocco but then he decided to come back because there was old scores to settle with the Lord Provost here in Edinburgh because of all his imprisonment and so on. So he returned to Edinburgh and he actually threatened to destroy it because they entered the Leith with a big ship uh, from Morocco uh, with all his supporters and he threatened to burn Edinburgh. But then he was able to have a conversation with the Lord Provost and he was aware that the plague was here in Edinburgh in 1645 and they found out that the daughter of the Lord Provost was suffering from the plague and being from Morocco he had a magical potion that he was able to give the daughter and she got better, she recovered and not the end of the story because he ended up marrying the Provost's daughter and living in this building here. Now that memorial to the story is that little man there and it said that that is a figurehead from a ship and it certainly looks to me as if it's somebody in Moorish traditional certainly. garb. So Morocco and another favourite hidden corner. Okay, so we're going to move up a little bit and uh, we're going to let Joe come on here to 
continue. And for all of the Doctor Who fans, we have another old police box here, which has been converted into a little coffee shop. That's right. A lot of them have been converted. In here, the policeman would have a telephone, a place to make tea, and a place to have a pee. That's right, that's <laughs> right. You don't want to be going in there if you weren't a policeman. Yeah. It's going to be a bit dodgy. Well, let's have a look at some of the views just through the gap here. You may recognise we that. We were there in an hour. We're going to talk here. about these buildings in a little while. Did someone mention Ragamuffin? Got Ragamuffin across the street here. It's been there for a long, long time. Great, great knitwear. And if you want a kill, this is a place to definitely come. Uh, we're, we're not giving you too many clues about what we're doing next week, but... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> We talk about the rain. I mean, there's a lot of people in uh, West Northwest states and in uh, British Columbia who would be pleased to have some of this rain here because the, uh, the temperatures, I believe, were unbearable uh, in uh, California, in Oregon, Washington State, right up to British Columbia. And I'm sure they'd be glad of this rain. I knew it was raining really heavily when my cats put on their own self -pre preservers and headed for the lifeboats. <laughs> So we're on Jeffrey Street. I'm going to do this part of the tour. I'm going to talk about three men. We'll just walk down a wee bit further. Uh, three men who were part of their time, but ahead of their time at the same time. If that makes sense. And the first one I'm going to talk about is Lord Francis Jeffrey. And this street is named after Lord Jeffrey. And we'll just walk down a wee bit so we'll get away from the crowds here, Mike. It's a little bit quieter as we walk down Jeffrey Street. So Lord Jeffrey was born at the end of the 1700, but 1770. He was born in Edinburgh. He was educated at Edinburgh University in the, in the law department. So the end of the 1700s, we're talking about the period of enlightenment. We're also talking about the period of political agitation. Um, you know, they had the, the, the American War of Independence. Things were happening in France. Radicals were approaching. Edinburgh was a hotbed of radicalism. So he went to graduated from, from, in law from Edinburgh University. But because he had Whig, which was kind of liberal leanings, he didn't do very well in the establishment here in Edinburgh. Edinburgh was considered to be part of the Henry Dundas benevolent despotism, as it were. So he didn't do very well here. So he, um, he and a couple of friends got together and they decided to launch a magazine, and this was the Edinburgh Review. Now, the Edinburgh Review started off as very non-political. Uh, each of the, the founders were contributing to this. They were commenting on not only political things that were happening, but cultural things, literal things. That were, and uh, Geoffrey was a bit of a critic um, himself. So Francis Geoffrey was criticised a lot. He didn't have much time for the romantic poets of uh, the lakes. So Wordsworth, Yeats, Yeats. And by, he didn't have much time for Byron either. He thought they were all a bit um, effete. Um, one of the criticisms they did, though, was to our Irish poet called Thomas Moore. Now, Thomas Moore was so incensed that he challenged Geoffrey to a duel. And this duel was to take place in Chalk Farm in London. This, this guy's going to go in a second here. So in Chalk Farm in London, so the duel was set up. So the duel was set up and they ended up in Chalk Farm, but the police got wind of this and the police stopped the duel from taking place. The police confiscated the pistols of Moore, of, of, of Thomas Moore, the writer, the, uh, the Irish poet, and also of Francis Jeffrey. When they opened up his pistol, they found that there was no bullet in the pistol. And from that, Moore and Geoffrey became the best of friends. And the Edinburgh Review got more political, it became more Whig. He got more involved in lots of political issues here. He debated with Walter Scott, he debated with all of the great debaters here at the time in Edinburgh. He was pushing for the people. He, after 26 years of editing the Edinburgh Review, he, we'll just walk down a wee bit, he went back to the law. He felt the, the call of the law again. So he went back and went back. He, he qualified to the bar. And he was pushing for the Whig political agenda. And in the 1830s, the Whigs, the Liberals, got back in 
to power, he was made Lord Advocate and he introduced a bill in Westminster and the bill was a Scottish Reform Bill and in 1832 the Scottish Revo Reform Bill was passed unanimously. There was a lot of radicalism going on and he was one of the great men that pushed against the conservative mentality of Edinburgh at the time. So this was a real hotbed. So I want you to remember his name here because it's going to come up a wee bit later because they're going to talk about somebody else from the same period whose future did, turn, did not turn out so well but is still well remembered. So this street is Jeffrey Street named after Lord Francis Jeffrey. Again, lots of lovely restaurants here. And I think if Mike can swing around, you're going to get some great views, despite I, the rain. You see, I just like to say, as they say in, as absolutely they, chucking it down here. As they say in Northern <laughs> England, it's coming down in stair rods again. <laughs> I'm so pleased, Mike. I've just invested in a um, stand-up paddle, you know, a paddleboard. Maybe we could do... We could do it today. I, could do it today. <laughs> <laughs> I should have brought it with me. I could just I could go down here. But one of my little favourite restaurants is coming up here. Um, I'll also mention my favourite things, but one of my favourite little French restaurants is a little one here called La Garrigue. Lovely, lovely. I've, lovely. I've been there, Joe, and I think the guy used to do wine tours of France, didn't he? He did. Yeah, he did. yeah. And, well. he, and he does food of the Languedoc region, so yeah, everything yeah. Brought is, is authentic from the Languedoc. Yeah. Um, so I would highly recommend it again. But the views here are quite spectacular, and, and I'm going to talk about these views. I'm going to try and interconnect the views with some of the stories I'm going to tell you about the guys here as well. So this shower is going to pass over. I'm just going to mention you've got your everyman. I mean, I, I introduced this when I was doing a preview of our tour, and that's the everyman statue down there uh, by Stefan Bauenkoll, uh, who was a German artist, and it's all to do with uh, representing what everybody does, but it just happens to be that that's a male figure. So it probably doesn't that was people, <laughs> people he People he referred to it as Joe Public as well. Joe Public, I suppose, yeah, because but of the very, white... a very controversial at the time, wasn't it? I mean, £100,000? £100, £100,000, and, and uh, it, it's on what could be ladder or scaffolding and uh, connects with uh, workers, unemployed, you name it, uh, and it's anonymous too. So uh, outside Edinburgh City Council, uh, buildings, which is the local government uh, offices here. But it's also, um, there's a few of his sculptures in the National uh, Gallery as well. And I went down at a big exhibition. When you see his stuff up close, it's really good. It's all wood carving. He's specialised in wood carving. Yeah, I'd agree. Um, yeah. And it is good. Like it. And this, what you're standing on, a few Edinburgh people may remember, there used to be a kinetic sculptor at the top of Leith Walk. That reminds me of the kinetic sculptor of Leith Walk. It does. It does. A sculpture, yeah. 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 This has all been re regenerated, of yeah. course, Joe, hasn't it, down here? Well, this all should be the marshalling and... yards, so there was yeah. nothing really much here at the time. This is all bus stations and marshalling mm -hmm. yards for the, for the railway. So yeah. there's a lot of new construction. The old and the new is juxtaposed quite nicely here. So let's continue down Jeffrey Street, and we'll talk about some of the other characters here that I will connect with. Again, you've got some great views over to the Balmoral Hotel from here. You can see the North Bridge, which is under repair at the moment. And also just right to the right of the clock, there's another building, and that's the old post office. And the post office, uh, you can only see about three or four floors of it, but it goes down about another six floors. And the, the mail train would arrive in the train station and all the mail would be sorted in there, so it didn't have to go very far. Now, this little building I want to point out here on the left, Mike, this goes back to the 1800s. And this is the manse for the church that I'm going to show you further down. So as we're walking, I'll talk, and I want to talk about another man of his time. We're going back to 1680s, 1690s. His name is, he was a bishop, and he was an Episcopal bishop of the, well, he's a bishop of the Episcopal church here in Scotland. That we've been... We've compared the, the Episcopal Church and the, uh, the Presbyterian Church, both Protestants, uh, but the Episcopals had the hierarchy, so this had bishops, hence Episcopal. And uh, at the time when William of Orange was invited over during the Glorious Revolution uh, to depose James VII, the churches in Scotland were quite troubled. They didn't know how to align themselves. The Presbyterians knew exactly where they were going to be. They supported the policies of William of Orange, without doubt. 
The Episcopal Church, however, had a bit of a difficulty. So the Episcopal bishops of Scotland didn't know whether they should be supporting William of Orange or the Stuarts under James VII. This was quite a difficult decision for them at the time. So there's a man called the Bishop called Bishop Alexander Rose. Alexander Rose was nominated with another, with another one of his colleagues to go down as a representation down to London to meet with William of Orange. Alexander Rose was still in two minds. He did not know if he could deliver the, the, the Scottish Episcopal bishops to the, to the monarch, and he didn't know if he could sell the monarch to the Episcopal bishops. So he was, in a, he was caught between a rock and a hard place. One of the famous quotes that he came out with, he said to William of Orange, I'm going to try and remember this, so I'll paraphrase it. I will serve you as far as the law, conscience, and reason will permit. So he never delivered the bishops. As a result, the Scottish Episcopate was abolished and they lost all of their properties. So they were not allowed to uh, preach in any of the properties here in Edinburgh. So Alexander Rose came down here to this area here and I'm going to show you this little close, it's called Carubber's Close. And he set up his congregation in a wool store, in an old wool store. So we're talking back in the 1680s, 1690s. And this congregation grew and grew, so the Episcopal, the Episcopal uh, Protestant religion still survived here in Edinburgh. A lot of it was still done in secrecy, but was a lot more accepted than, say, the Papal Church. So they weren't really run at a town as such, but they had to keep everything on a low light, basically. So, having established his congregation, but bearing in mind he had firmly, firmly nailed his colours to the Jacobite cause as well, and we're just, we're just coming up to Carubber's Close here, and Mike can get a picture of the church here. I'm going to talk about the church as well. The church is connected. There's another of these uh, courses that we're talking about before, uh, Joe. It's just like getting over to visitors that we uh, want these to be more visited. Yeah, some people just think, yeah, go up there, there'll be a bit of antisocial behaviour and stuff like that. So it's an ongoing project where they're looking at all the different courses, these narrow divisions between the buildings, and I think it is great. So look out for that one. The, the the twelve closest partnership and they and, they're, and they're very yeah. safe. That, that's, yeah. that's what I would say to people. Yeah. They are foreboding, but they're very safe. And we use them as tourist guides. We use them as little rat runs because we can meet a group somewhere and join up the group at the other side. So we do use it a lot. So we'll go back to this Carubbers close here, Mike. We just come down to the bottom here, yeah. and bear in mind this church here because this is the church that grew out of. So this is Saint Paul. This is Saint Paul's. Episcopal Church, which was built in the early 1800s, and I'll talk a wee bit more about that. I want to go take you a little back to the connection with Alexander Rose. So Alexander Rose and the bishops, the Episcopal bishops, nailed their colours to the Jacobite mast. His son, so Alexander Rose's son, fought in the Battle of Sheriff Muir, one of the first uh, Jacobite uprisings, and they fought in Sheriff Muir. And uh, he was arrested, uh, but then he got let off as well. So he didn't, he wasn't uh, uh, executed for fighting with the Jacobites. Uh, he survived. So uh, then come up to 1744, when we have Bonnie Prince Charlie coming over. And we have the, another Jacobite rising taking place. And it was one of these, the congregation of this church here, the church wasn't built then, but of the congregation that met in Carubbers Close, who was at the Battle of Preston Pans, where Bonnie Prince Charlie's army defeated Johnny Cope. And having seen it, then the Hanoverian army were being defeated. The member of the congregation got on his horse, raced back up to Edinburgh, told the people of Edinburgh that uh, the Hanoverians had closed. So the Hanoverian army was coming back into Edinburgh and they closed the gates to prevent the army from getting back here. So again, a good connection with this congregation. The church itself was designed by a, a, a student of Gilbert Scott. And if you remember when we did St. Mary's Episcopal Cathedral, uh, we remember telling you that it was built by Gilbert Scott. Well, this was built in the English style. And it's open on Sundays, great place to go. And they've got a great choir that practices in here.
it's and more it's taken sort of away. French architecture, Joe, isn't it? Sometimes it's a bit it's sort of gentler, kind of English college chapel architecture, as opposed to the Gothic German, if you like, Northern Europe influenced Scottish Gothic, you know, yeah. which is, uh, yeah. Yeah, I would say so. And the windows, again, the windows are stay, beautiful stained glass windows, and in winter time, when you're coming up here and you see the light from the inside, it is absolutely beautiful. So again, I'm going to talk a wee bit more about Kerr Roberts Close. And Mike can just get another one of these horses here, alleyways, that leads from the up from here up to the Royal Mile. I mean, they are spectacular, these closes. Now, uh, if you can visit it, come and have a look at them. They are, they are really spectacular. Yeah, another thing about the project is it's light. It's interesting light effects and so on, as well as sound, too, yeah. and as well as artwork that... Uh, is getting brought in and uh, yeah it's great and there's another bit of uh, sculpture yeah. so hopefully you're all staying with us and the rain's not putting you all off it's not putting me off it's, it's actually quite warm that's a surprise yeah. so the last person i'm going to talk about another man ahead of his time so i've mentioned lord francis jeffrey i mentioned alec bishop alexander rose connection with it just and we walk no more than 100 yards and we've got three main characters in Scottish history and the last one I want to speak about is Thomas Muir of Hunters Hill Thomas Muir himself uh, was born in Glasgow he was born above his grocery shop uh, in the high street of Glasgow and if you're watching last week we were actually just at the top of the high street at Glasgow Cathedral the high street was old university area Thomas Muir entered the U at Glasgow University at the age of 10 and he graduated in divinity uh, in the uh, about uh, when he was 17 years old, but he gave up divinity for law. He fell out. He he fell out with the people at Glasgow University. He expelled himself with a few others because of politics. Uh, again, this goes back to the Whigs and the Conservatives. And uh, he, rather than being kicked out of Glasgow University, he resigned from Glasgow University. However, he came over to Edinburgh and studied law at Edinburgh University. And he studied under some Whig tutors, so liberal tutors. He had a very, very interesting history. He started to organise, he was very much influenced by what was happening in France, what was happening in North America, as were a lot of people here in Scotland and also in England. And he started to organise the Friends of the People. Um, these were organisations throughout the whole of Scotland. So he became very involved in Scottish politics. He then became under the focus of Robert Dundas. Now we've spoken of Henry Dundas who was the Lord Advocate at the time of Francis Jeffrey. Well his son Robert Dundas also was the Lord Advocate and he then started to put an eye on Thomas Muir. He was very suspicious of Thomas Muir of his politics and also his preaching and also because he was undermining what was happening. Basically he was shaking the, the foundations of the establishment here in Scotland. Uh, we mentioned before what they called the benevolent despotism that was going on here. Thomas Muir was then standing uh, as a lawyer to defend a guy we've spoken of before as well called James Titler. T-Y-T-L-E-R. Titler was famous because he was the editor of the Encyclopedia Britannica but he was also a political pamphleteer. He also wrote the who's who of the best whores in Edinburgh. If you remember that, he wrote the book. Um, um, the, almost like a trip advisor as to the best ladies of the night here in Edinburgh. Well, because of his political pamphleteering, he was put, arrested and was put on trial for sedition. So he was standing trial here in Edinburgh. Thomas Muir came over from Glasgow. He had lodgings here in Carrubber's Close as well, and he would have political. So Thomas Muir would have political meetings in his own lodgings as well. While he was on his way to Edinburgh. Thomas Muir was arrested under the advice of Robert Dundas. So he was taken over there and he was put on trial for himself for sedition, but he was released on bail. While he was on bail, waiting for his trial to come up, he travelled down to London and over to France to advise all the other political groups that he was engaged with as to what was happening here in Scotland. While he was out of the country in France, Robert Dundas brought forward his trial by months while he was at the country. So while he was at the country, they had he was not allowed to defend himself, he had passport issues, could not get past the country. 
and he was charged in absentia and was made an outlaw. He came back to Scotland, knowing the full situation, he got arrested, he was arrested, put on trial, accused of sedition, and then put in prison across the street here, where you'll see the old Castellate building, which is the governor's house, which is the old governor's house of Carlton Prison. Carlton Prison was just next door where the modern, well, 1930s building is. That's the old Carlton Prison. So he was in prison there and he was transported to Australia with four other, what they're known as the martyrs. One of them was a, a guy called Scriving who came from Fife. And I'll just remember the other names, I'll keep it in my pocket here. One was called Palmer, one was called Gerard, Ger Gerard and one was called uh, another one with a French name whose name escapes me, but I'll find it. I thought I kept it in my pocket, but I have not. Because I have. So I'll give the five men the due, give them names. So Thomas Palmer, Joseph Gerard, Maurice Margaro, William Scriving, and Thomas Muir. All of them exported or sent off to Australia in a ship called the Surprise, sent off to Botany Bay. It didn't finish there though. When they left, they left with a bit of money because the Whigs and the supporters raised money for them. So they didn't actually endure the harsh conditions as most prisoners were because they were political prisoners. And uh, they were able to build brick houses in over in Australia and Botany Bay in Sydney area. However, Thomas Muir was not satisfied with his lot and he decided to escape and return. He got on board, sneaked on board a ship and ended up in Monterey in California. Was then imprisoned in Mexico City, also in Havana in Cuba, so he was held under the Spanish auspices there. Spain and Britain were not in the best of terms. He was able to get free with the help of the French and got aboard a, a ship, a Spanish ship, bound for Spain to get back to mainland Europe. When he got to Cadiz in Spain, Britain was blockading the port. The Spanish ships then turned away, the British ships attacked, and he was severely injured. His whole face was smashed out, he lost his jaw, and his whole face was smashed in. However, he managed to make it to France. He was then heralded as a citizen of the people. He got the highest accolade in France, but he actually died in Paris not long after reaching it. And so he was highly, highly regarded. He met Thomas Paine, he met the people of the, rev who were of the revolution in France, highly regarded everywhere else. And here, in Britain, and, in, and I mean in Britain because the martyrs were English and Scottish. They were not just Scottish martyrs, they were English and Scottish. So the friends of the martyrs raised money and Mike can come down here, we've got a better view of it down here. You can see the obelisk standing here on the hill. This is the obelisk to the martyrs, to the five martyrs. And so just opposite here, you can see the obelisk right opposite where Thomas Muir had his lodgings here in Edinburgh. So this little close here was a hotbed of political activity all the way through the Jacobite period, right up to the eight, late 1800s. And we've only walked 100 yards. And I want to tell you also that um, if you ever watch Outlander, Corrobert's Close also features in Outlander as well. And there were printing presses, and we're only, again, a few hundred yards from Encyclopedia, where Encyclopedia Britannica was being produced as well. So there's everywhere here on the old town, it was a hotbed of political activity. Yeah. And I'd just like to talk about the number of closes. There's about 73 uh, closes in the old town of Edinburgh. And the oldest one is called Stephen's Law Close, Stephen's Law, who was a glazier to Mary Queen of Scots and that's who it's named after, but it actually goes back to 13th century, yep. Stephen Law's close. So uh, a lot of these closes to explore when you come back to Edinburgh. Yeah, and we'll happily take you on a little winding tour throughout the closes, because some of them are so interesting, and every single close has a story. And of course, with if you come with Mike and Joe when you're back in Edinburgh, 
I want to say, Mike, we've been quite successful because I've got two people who are coming up to Edinburgh. I'm meeting uh, my cousin, Frances Courtney, if she's on. She's probably watching Wimbledon. But Frances Courtney's coming up at the end of this month. And also Phil Butterworth is coming up and we're going on little tours of Scotland. So again, if you want to come and join us, you're more than welcome.